Hi, everyone. Welcome to Authors at Google. We're very happy to be presenting Paula Spam. She's the author of a new book, When the Time Comes. When the Time Comes is concerned with an issue that um, many of us are facing and many of us will be facing either with our parents or someday with ourselves. Um, at the moment, about 35 million Americans are caring for an older adult. That's a number that's going to increase as the baby boomers age. Um, when the Time Comes discusses how a group of families dealt with the issue, the many decisions they faced, and the choices they had. So I'm very happy to present, be presenting Paula Spann. Thanks so much. Um, please let me know if you're ha having trouble hearing. Uh, I began working on this book because I have a, a past as a Washington Post reporter and started doing some reporting about assisted living and other new industries that were springing up to help people take care of their elders. Um, but the big, the big impetus is that at a certain point in your 40s or 50s, uh, and when you start running into people at the gym or the supermarket or at work, the people that used to talk to you about your, yourself or your children, now you're just hearing a lot about parents. Everybody who used to be concerned with your kids' SATs is concerned about your parents' ADLs. ADL is a, a activity of daily living. How much help do they need to function? Um, people get less concerned about getting their children into Middlebury and more concerned about getting their parents into the proper nursing home. It just starts to be in the air. And if you're not there, um, it's probably coming. Because the fact is that about two-thirds of elderly Americans need some kind of long-term care. Long-term care just means that you need help to maintain, your, um, to maintain your ability to function. Uh, it can be paid or unpaid. It doesn't mean you need to be institutionalized. It can be at home or it can be in a facility. But two-thirds, that's, that's pretty good odds that um, we're going to need to be able to provide some help if that's our family. And the fact is that most of us are not very prepared for this when it hits. And I think one reason is n nobody really likes to think about this. Nobody looks forward to it. Uh, and the other factor probably is that people live so much longer that it's perfectly possible for our parents to just go chugging right through their 60s and right through their 70s and everything's fine. They hardly need much help from us. And so we can be forgiven to think, thinking, well, they're fine. I don't have to do anything much except show up at Thanksgiving. Um, but then the change comes. Either it comes quickly, you get the call your fa that everybody dreads. Your father's had a stroke, or your mother fell and broke her hip. Or sometimes it happens gradually. You, you, know, the, you, you visit and there's no food in the refrigerator. Or there is food in the refrigerator and it's been there too long. Or you go driving with them and think, uh-oh, this is a person who probably shouldn't be on the road. Something happens, and then their lives change and our lives change. And we don't know much about this in advance. We don't know really what the difference is between independent living and assisted living. People tend not to know the difference between Medicare and Medicaid, and they don't have to for years and years. And then at some point, it becomes crucially important. Um, and we, we tend not to know what hospice is or we have misperceptions about what it is, when that's something that can be a huge help at some point. So um, my, my goal in trying to um, put this book together was to help my, my peers, the baby boomers, and the people coming after us who are going to take care of us, to help them get a sense of what's coming. The, um, the way I decided... Um, to do this is to tell some family stories. Uh, journalists know that um, one way to get people to read about subjects they think they don't want to read about is to tell them a story. And that's the way this book is set up. Because the fact is that, that people still do step up and do this. It's just a slur that somehow in the golden nostalgic past, we all took fabulous care of our parents and now we just abandon them. It's just nonsense. Uh, nursing home use has been falling for 20 years. Uh, the um, idea that the boomers, um, the most resented generation, you know, 40 years ago, some people, you know, 
did a little marching, smoked some dope and took off their bras and they resent us for it 40 years later. But it's still the case that people take care of their parents. This is not something government does, as you may discover to your horror when you get there. Um, this is something that families do. Families are the backbone of the system still. And um, AARP did a study a few years ago to try to put a price tag on what would it cost if um, we actually paid families for all that they do for their elderly relatives. $350 billion, it was huger than the entire Medicare budget. No one's going to be able to pay this, even with health care reform. Th th this still falls mostly to us. So I wanted to um, look at the way some families handle this, um, well, you could call it a challenge, you could call it a burden, you could call it an opportunity, but it's, it's a job. It's a job that most people will take on. The average time that people need long-term care is three years. We probably should think of it as uh, just an inevitable or expected part of the adult life cycle. You know, we prepare for the other ones. We take our education very seriously. We prepare for careers. We certainly prepare like crazy to be parents. Um, but we're not prepared for, for this one, and yet it's probably coming for us. It's harder than it used to be in some ways because people live so much longer. You know, a, a, a man who hits age 65 on average, lives another 17 years, and a woman lives another 20 years. And people at Google are not average. You have better health care, and um, you are higher socioeconomic le levels. So it, uh, there are plenty of people in my book that were in their 90s, and that may be us too. So in the past, people just had to provide less care. The, the things that used to carry people off swiftly, like heart attacks and strokes, the death rate is way down. These are now manageable chronic diseases. But manageable means that somebody's got to manage them. So um, people who take care of or help elderly people have to help them manage these arsenals of medications that didn't used to exist, take them to the rounds of medical specialists that people didn't used to go to. Um, family, younger family members are working, both men and women. Um, people have deferred childbearing, so it's entirely possible that you're trying to help out an elderly parent and at the same time you have young children at home. And the extended lifespan means that we may be uh, at what used to be retirement age ourselves when we are taking care of elderly parents. Uh, I'm turning 60 this summer. When my father was my age, he was retired and both his parents were dead. Um, he's 86 and doing pretty well, but it's entirely possible that I'll be taking care of him or helping him when he, I'm 70 and he's 96. This, is, this can happen. Um, also, the extended um, lifespan means that rates of dementia are rising. So people can be physically fairly healthy, but they still need help and can't function independently. They need help managing their lives. So not to be grim about it, this is a... Um, a job that many of us are going to have, and it's not an easy job. It does, however, have some uh, compensations. I don't want to be saccharine about it, but people, people tend to want to be helpful, and they feel a responsibility to step up and help their parents. They do step up and help their parents. And when they do it, it's not always you know, a, a golden age of reconciliation and joy. But people have a sense of a job well done, and they take satisfaction in it, and they find it meaningful. Uh, and frankly, they do it because there's no one else to do it. You know, it, like like the Marvelettes uh, said, "Baby, it's you. It, it's us. Um, this is going to be our job." I um, I do think we do it differently. M my working hypothesis is that. Um, the baby boomers watch too many episodes of an old 70s TV program called The Waltons. Remember The Waltons? The Waltons all lived on a mountaintop in, in West Virginia in the depths of the Depression. And at the end of the show, you'd see the lights in the um, farmhouse in West Virginia. And you'd see the lights go out and people would say, the soundtrack would say, good night, Jim Bob, good night, John Boy, good night, Mama, good night, Papa, and good night, Grandma. Good night, Grandpa, because they all live together on Walton's Mountain. And when we are not able to provide a similar multi-generational warm and cozy household, we, people tend to feel like they have failed. You know, to, to put somebody in a facility, which nobody really wants to do, 
feels like a failure. And so we're, we're working to try to keep people at home longer. There are many more options to keep people at home longer. But and having more options is a good thing. Assisted living is something that really rose in the past couple of decades. There are new professions that didn't used to exist 20 years ago to help people take care of the elderly, especially if they're long distance. There are all kinds of programs. It's good to have options, but it also makes it more confusing. There's more to know. So how am I going to tell people about this and not totally bum them out? Um, I found about a dozen families who would let me, as a journalist, follow them through this decision-making process, which is often one of the hardest parts of this, and then through a, a transition, and let's see how it worked out. And I, I, um, I found uh, a family in, the mother lived in the Bronx, in her little brick house that was the only house that she had ever owned. And her daughter wanted to help keep her there by hiring home care. So that's a chapter, there's a home care chapter. The essential challenge for this daughter was, could she keep hiring people as quickly as her mother was firing them? She went through, she went through eight people the first year. She would say five, I say eight. We have a little disagreement here because she's not counting the ones she hired that never actually showed up but I think we should count them. So I'm saying eight the first year. Um, but she did eventually find a live-in person who would be with her mother, and her mother is still in her house in the Bronx, and it's been two years. When you're talking about taking care of a person with multiple health problems in their 80s, if you can keep them at home for two more years, that's a win. That, that's a job well done. Um, there's also a daughter who moved her mother into her own household in upstate New York. There it is, the multi-generational household, not like the Waltons, um, and a stressful thing to do. Um, more common in certain ethnic communities. It's, it's still true among um, Latinos and Asians, uh, also more true among African Americans, that uh, people are likely to bring their parents into their own homes. But uh, it, it stresses uh, result, uh, but it can work well, especially when people know what they're getting into. Then there are two families in Boston that are considering assisted living. Um, one person moves, one doesn't. There are two families in suburban Trenton, New Jersey, who use a nursing home, a nonprofit nursing home. The, the great bugaboo, the thing nobody wants to do, but there are times when that's the best option or the only option. If you have somebody that you need to turn every two hours, need to reposition every two hours so that that person does not get um, a bed sore, which is painful and dangerous. Who can, nobody can turn somebody every two hours all by themselves unless you are hugely wealthy and can hire 24-7 aides. You have to sleep sometime. Um, and not, not all nursing homes are, horror, are horrors and um, there have been improvements due to federal regulation in the past 20 years, though not as many as we would like. And there's a hospice chapter set in Baltimore for the end of life. Uh, I'm an advocate for hospice. I think it's underused and hugely helpful. Nothing can make it easy to have a parent die, but hospice can help make it not as hard. So I, I think about what I'm asking these families to do. I show up. I find them in various ways, ads in the paper, contacting institutions, friends of friends, and kind of show up and say, hi, you don't know me, um, but I'm this journalist, and I'm here I am with my notebook and my tape recorder, and here's what I want to do. At a time of maximum stress in your life, I want to take hours and hours of your time in interviews that you cannot spare. I want to follow you along through this process. I want to interview you, your siblings who might be at, at war with you, or might not. Um, your parents, I want to ask questions about your family dynamics. I want to ask how you're financing this. I want to do this for months to see how it works out. Um, I want to use your real name, no composites, no fake names. You know, th that's not what journalists do. I want to, people to know that you are real. I want you to have your, your photo on the website, paulaspan.com. I want your video. Um, and no, you don't get to see it when I'm done. I'll check it, the facts with you, but I can't just hand it over to you. I, journalists don't give veto power to the people that they're writing about. Uh, so not, not surprisingly, a number of people said, are you out of your mind? And uh, other people said, that's a book I'd like to read, but I don't think I want to be in it. Um, but I did find about a dozen people who would do this with me, sign releases, 
uh, the whole Megillah because, I think, for one thing, taking care of a parent, taking care of anybody, but especially a parent, parents know how to push our buttons because they installed the buttons, right? So um, I think they did it because caregiving is hard work. It's unacknowledged by much of the rest of society. It's unpaid. It's um, difficult and sometimes frustrating, and sometimes the people you are working so hard to help do not say, thank you, what a great job you're doing, I appreciate it. Um, so just to have somebody sit there the way reporters know how to do and listen, you know, the therapeutic act of listening, I think, was attractive to some people. But I think the bigger reason is that these families knew what learning curves that they had attempted, that in the space of months, they suddenly had to become experts in all kinds of medical knowledge, uh, social services, federal regulations, um, that they thought, well, maybe by doing this book with this stranger, I'll make it a little easier for somebody else. Um, that was their hope. And of course, that's my hope too, is, is that, um, we can be a little better prepared for this part of the life cycle that is coming for most of us. Um, I put a big resource list at the back of the book with websites and books and, and um, DVDs that might be useful. But the heart of it is the family stories. I tucked a lot of research around it, the academic research, the gerontological research, the um, uh, government data, the average costs to try to make it useful for people. But I think the real, um, the real purpose here is not to be an elder care manual, because those exist already, um, but to be a support group in print. Here's how some people did it. Here's their story. Here's what you can learn from it. When I say that it would be useful to prepare for this part of the life cycle, I don't really mean that as soon as our parents turn 70, we should run out and get brochures from assisted living facilities, because um, aging is so variable. Uh, the youngest uh, parent in this book is 71 and has dementia from multiple sclerosis. And the, well, the oldest person in the book is 102, living with his daughter. Um, and then there's a 95-year-old who's considering whether she wants to move into assisted living or not. Is it time when you're 95, uh, or is it not? Um, so if, if people run out and get brochures at 70, and your mother is still thinking about it at 95, these brochures are going to be pretty out of date. Um, so I don't, I don't mean that um, we have to know exactly what we're going to do. We can't know that. We don't know if we have the person who at 95 is managing quite well in senior housing and just needs help paying her bills and filling the pill pack for the week, or if it's the person at 71 who, because of dementia, can no longer live alone and needs to be in a facility. But I think what we can do is at least to understand a little bit about the landscape. What are the major options that are available to us? What is the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? Um, just to get a, a general grasp of, of when to start looking for problems and, and the range of things that are available to help us. Lots of options before you get to nursing home. And this is a change from the way it used to be. There used to be people in nursing homes who really didn't need round-the-clock nursing, but there was no other place to live when you were no, way, no longer able to be fully independent in your own household. Now there's lots of different options. There are adult day programs, for example, sometimes called adult daycare, although some people find that an infanticizing um, term. But it explains what it is. Uh, it's a place that elderly people can go during the day have their health care monitored by an on-site nurse, have activities with other people, be stimulated, have a good meal so you don't have to worry about the stove, the shopping, the nutrition, and then go home at the end of the day so that they're not at home all day with a television set and no one else. Because home, much as it's preferred by almost everybody, can be a very isolating place and an under-stimulating place. So there are 4,000 adult day programs, and we probably pay little attention to them. They're one of those invisible things until you need them. But, and there need to be more than 4,000, but they're there. And it's an option for people who don't need to have supervision all the time, but you don't want them alone all day. And you can't be there because you're working or because you live 1,500 miles away. That's a possibility. 
the other, there's a, something called a geriatric care manager. This is a fairly new profession just in the past 20 years. These are social workers usually, occasionally nurses, who have additional training and credentials and can help you assess what does my parent need and what's the best place to get it. Uh, costs some money, but less money than flying to Florida every three weeks trying to do this long distance. Uh, it's a help. Um, to know that when you get a terminal diagnosis, and this happens, you know, immortality is not one of the options. Uh, and I, f I find that people don't understand that hospice is a service and not limited to the elderly. For anybody with a terminal diagnosis of, of a terminal disease, um, hospice will come to your home, your parents' home, your, the place that your parent calls home, could be assisted living, could be your own household, could be a nursing home, um, and provide nurses, a social worker, homemaking aides, a chaplain, um, to help people through the last months of their lives. And Medicare pays for it. Your tax dollars at work doing something really useful for once. Um, families are hugely appreciative of it, and yet uh, they don't call in time. So I'm hoping that by um, writing about it, talking about it, starting the conversation, people will know a little bit more about what lies ahead. It's, um, it's not something that gets discussed a lot. It's not something people like talking about. But it's something that I think we'll, we will, as, um, as sons and daughters, nieces and nephews, um, want to know more about. And it can happen tomorrow, or it could happen 20 years from now. Unpredictability is built into the system. One thing that we can do, though, already, even when we're fairly young and our parents are fairly young and healthy, in fact, this is the time to do it when they're fairly healthy and lucid um, and able to have conversations with you. Uh, one thing that is useful is to begin having these discussions, these discussions about what would you want me to do if. And sometimes this is the hardest part, I know. It's, it's easier said than done. Who wants to talk about this? Who wants to go home at Thanksgiving and say, let's talk about your advanced directives? Um, it was a service that Terry Skyvo in, Cal in uh, Florida did uh, un unknowingly, is a lot of people after that case s signed advanced directives, understanding what could happen if they didn't, that people could be kept alive on ventilators for years, that families could fight tooth and nail through courts, court after court, to try to control what happened, because there was no clear legal statement from the person, him or herself, about what her preferences were, what she would want. And, and you don't have to be elderly to have advanced directives. Um, I, have, I have mine. And um, actually, when most people have children and they make out a will and appoint guardians for their children, this is also a good time to do the other part of it because you know, any of us could need an advanced directive. A health care proxy, appointing somebody to make decisions for you um, if you are incapacitated. It doesn't necessarily mean turning off a ventilator. It can mean leaving you on. It just sets out what you want. Uh, a power of attorney, which means if somebody needs to have access to your bank account to pay your rent while you're in a rehab facility for a few weeks, which can also happen at any age, somebody has the legal ability to do that, to sell a car you no longer need. Um, so. And because this is a way of decoupling the conversation from pure age, because anybody can need and should have an advanced directive, maybe it's a little less threatening to parents to say, I've got mine. We should talk about yours. To make it a hypothetical discussion, what would you like me to do if? Yeah. Dad, where would you like to live if? Long before it's needed. Uh, it, it's the toughest thing to do sometimes. Uh, and yet it can be really, it can make the difference between uh, a crisis in which nobody knows what to do and various parties with various interests are at odds with each other about what to do and having the person himself or herself set out her wishes. I would always frame it as a question of autonomy. This is up to you. We will do what you ask us to do. Just tell us what it is. It's not a bad place to start. I, I know that some people here have parents that are still in their 70s and they're doing fine. Great. Uh, my father's doing really pretty well at 86. I call myself a caregiver in waiting because he really doesn't need much from me yet. Um, but I'm keeping an eye on him, you know. I, 
the next time I go down, I realize I always drive when we go out to dinner at this favorite Greek restaurant that nobody in his building likes, so I go with him. And next time I should let him drive and let him see how, you know, just keep an eye on, is he able to see well enough? Is, is he able to stop soon enough? Um, you know, I'm in that monitoring phase that you may not be in yet. Um, but the monitoring phase is going to be the easy part, I know. And I'm trying, in a way, through writing this book, to prepare myself as, as well as my peers. So I thank you for your help, and I'm happy to for your listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, or maybe you have had some experience with this that you want to talk about and let your employee, fellow employees know about. It's, um, it's going to be an interesting journey. And um, I think, as always, we're going to learn from each other. Thank you. If you have a question, we should be passing around the microphone. Oh, right. Or you can just come up and ask. Is there a short way you can describe the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? Yes. There is a short way, although it will necessarily be um, uh, insufficient. Medicare is the national federally funded program that provides health insurance for the elderly and also for some disabled people. Medicaid is the state and federal partnership that will be slightly different in each state that provides medical care for the poor. Now, when you're elderly, it is very easy to become poor, even if you've been a middle class person all your life. All you have to do is be in a nursing home or assisted living and, quote, spend down, and your assets will go quite quickly. The average um, uh, cost for a nursing home in the, this country is about six or $7,000 a month, and California is not going to be average. Uh, so people spend down, and at that point at which they have only a few thousand dollars in assets, and they can also have a house, um, Medicaid takes over, and Medicaid pays for most nursing home care. Medicare only pays for doctors, hospitals, now drugs, and some at-home care when you're recovering from a hospitalization, but it does not provide long-term care. Medicaid provides long-term care, but mostly in nursing homes. Now, if you're saying this is a crazy system, you're right. That's a rational response to a screwy system in which most dollars go to pay for nursing homes, the place nobody wants to be, and fewer Medicaid dollars pay for home care, the place where people do want to be. And over time, this balance is shifting a little bit so that more dollars are available to take care of people at home. But it's a slow process, and it still mostly pays for nursing homes. And there is much hope that during this discussion of health care reform in Washington, that long-term care does not get slated, that there is something to make it easier. And there are various proposals afoot, uh, including an insurance plan from Ted Kennedy that will make it easier uh, a, few, a few years down the road, but it is expensive and people are being very cost conscious and it's not clear how much help there's going to be. Thank you. That an answer? Yeah. So I'm concerned my parents aren't doing all they should be doing to maintain their health. Is there anything, recommendations okay. on how to coerce them to be healthier? <laughs> how to coerce your parents into healthy living. Boy, if I knew that, I would, I would patent it. Um, okay, a couple of things parents, uh, first of all, let me just say a word about long-term care insurance, uh, which only 10% of the elderly or less currently have, but is the only sort of private way to, to insure about uh, finding a way to pay for these big costs that tend to occur the last few years of life, but they're big. And unless you impoverish yourself and are on Medicaid, which is not really a way you'd want to go if you can avoid it, um, you either have to have had a lot of savings or long-term care insurance, which is um, something that would make sense to buy earlier because rates are lower. Uh, and I have, you know, in the course of researching this book, I bought a long-term care policy. I got it through my credit union, $1,700 a year. It means it insures me for three years or so, which is the average that people need, three years of long-term care, either at home or in a facility. Uh, and it's a, it's a flexible policy, so it covers dementia, too. Um, 
more than 10% of people will need this, even though it's still a new product and there's a lot of questions about what's the best way to do it, who are the best insurance companies. But the National Association of Insurance Commissioners has um, pretty good guidebooks about long-term care insurance. As opposed to then for the healthy living part, you know, one of the tricky parts here is that uh, you sometimes hear caring for parents as being analogous to raising children, and it's just not. Yes, there are similarities. People become dependent. Um, it, these similarities can include feeding and diapers, but these are adults, and we are not the boss of them. They will not do, there's no t-shirt that says, because I'm the daughter, that's why. So I think your, your ability to coerce them, as you put it, into healthy living is limited, but sometimes you can um, enlist the help of a neutral party. Sometimes people will listen to the family doctor, the family lawyer, a geriatric care manager, a social worker, someone with initials after their name, that's not their kid, you know, because what do their kids know? Um, so if you have someone else who can talk to your parents about uh, a more appropriate diet for somebody who's diabetic, about getting out and walking, um, all these things that you're talking about, stopping smoking, that might work better than if it's you. Sometimes if you en uh, enlist siblings, so it's a united front. We, we've been talking about this, Mom. We're worried about the fact that you're not getting enough physical activity. Look, we found a couple of walking groups here in town. You know, why don't we check it out? Maybe that helps. Or maybe nothing helps. You know, they're, they're adults. We can't make them do what we want to do. They can make their own choices, even if they're not the choices that we wish they would make. Yeah. Um, so I have actually two questions I suspect are common situations. In yes. This. One is, what about when you and all your siblings don't live anywhere near your parents? And what, uh, particularly in the pre-care leading up to, what, right. what advice? And then another one that certainly my situation, I think a lot of people are in, is my the woman that my father's married to is not my mother. Um, and those represent sort of two different cultures coming together about things. And um, she's ahead of me in line in terms of making decisions. And so yeah. that uh, raises a lot of tensions around a lot of things. Um, let, let's start with the first one, which is about you know what's commonly called long, uh, long distance caregiving. Because um, we were a mobile society. We're actually less mobile than we were 30 or 40 years ago, demographically. But it is true that we can be trying to keep an eye on somebody that we only see two or three times a year. Phone calls are not always a reliable indicator of how well someone's doing. What you really want is to look in the refrigerator and see, is there no food in the refrigerator? Or is there food in the refrigerator that's been there too long? Um, so uh, it's difficult. I, mean, I think one thing is we, we sometimes families tend to all be to, uh, to converge at the same time, which is nice for the family. But actually, in terms of keeping an eye on a parent, it might make sense to stagger the visits so that if you have two or three siblings, someone's there every two months instead of everybody being there twice a year. But the other thing that might be useful um, is these geriatric care managers. Now, there are also uh, social service agencies for the elderly in most cities, and many times they're nonprofit. Uh, they can be uh, organized by a faith group, you know, Catholic charities, Jewish family agencies. So you can often find a, a social worker who can work with you even when you're not there, but then you're parent has to accept this social worker, uh, which is hard. And a geriatric care manager is also a social worker, probably. But the difference is that this person works for you as opposed to an agency. So you can only hire this person to do the specific things that you need, think are needed. Um, maybe it's the assessment. We don't really know if she's safe at home. Can you take a look um, and, and tell us, do we need to retrofit the house? There are whole companies that will do this now. Do we need a stair glide because the stairs are dangerous? Do we need grab bars in the bathroom because the bathroom falls are, all the surfaces are hard and slick and a little scary? Um, do we need someone to drive her? Or is she basically doing okay and we just need someone to check in on her every month or so and make sure she's okay? So you can purchase the part of that service that you need. It's not a, a package. Um, and I have followed a few geriatric care managers around, and I, I'm impressed with them. If you have somebody who's been in that facility, not in that location, where your parent is practicing for 10 years or 15 years, then she knows 
what are the good assisted living places and which are the ones you'd like to avoid? What are the good home care agencies? And because she's a social worker, she also has skills at mediating with family members, which goes to your second question about, you know, the definition of family has gotten quite elastic. And um, many of our parents will have gone through that big spike in divorces in the 70s. And so we might have four people to take care of or three people. You know, parents, step-parents, and we might have siblings and step-siblings that are involved in these negotiations. So having a mediator, an arbitrator, somebody who can work with the parent, can work with the family, can try to get everybody engaged and on the same page, can figure out how various family members can help, because the one that's closest always gets you know, the worst of it, but maybe other people can help financially. Maybe they can help with respite care, so someone comes in for a week or two weeks in the summer so that the, the primary caregiver can get a vacation. Um, I, I'm a kind of a, a fan of these new uh, companies and these new care managers because they feel a need. And if they've been at it for a while, they often can help uh, navigate through some of these questions. I, I would check them out. Yeah. Uh, for, uh, I think you should make those t-shirts. <laughs> Because I'm the daughter, that's why. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, I think you're right. There could be a market there. Yeah, with a little uh, and with a with a little blurb about your book on it. It's a, it would be a it would be something you could. Cope All right. With. Yeah. Good marketing. I, I thank you. Uh, I, um, I'd like to uh, uh, put in a little pitch, not to that we don't underestimate our elders. Also, that uh, uh, my aunt had a um, serious stroke when she was in her late sixties and was uh, 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 lived much of the rest of, well, the whole rest of her life in, board, in a board and care facility where mm -hmm. uh, she wasn't uh, completely incapacitated, but she really wasn't all there, and she needed, the, she needed the help. My sister and I went to visit her when she had been there for about 10 years, and uh, we, we walked into this place where there were, uh, that was really pretty grim, and it was, um, uh, um, it was um, uh, full of full of people who, many of whom, are much worse off than her, and the and the people running the place were just doing a job, and it wasn't. I didn't get the feeling that the whole place was was uh, uh, mm. thoughtful and and supporting of them. So we asked we asked her what she wanted to do, and she said, "Oh, let's go out for lunch," and said, "Okay, where are we going to go?" And she said, "Let's go around to the place around the corner," and we go into this. To, to this amazingly hip uh, diner where all the people knew her, and she was suddenly in the uh, in the situation where she had been 40 years before when she'd been taking my cousins to Sardis in 21, which they had told her about. Uh, they had, uh, had made a huge impression on them. So she had a social network, even though it wasn't in her residence. Yes. Yeah, and you know, that's important. I think sometimes our initial reaction when somebody needs help is, let's move them so they can be close to us. And sometimes that's necessary, and sometimes it works. But when people have friendships uh, and connections in the place where they are, you don't necessarily want to rip them away from that. It, you know, it's part of people's identity. It's part of all of our identity. Well, and she, had she had made these, I mean, she had made these friends right. in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, Restaurant is a place called uh, Swingers on Beverly Boulevard in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> I love your aunt going to Swingers in Los Angeles. Um, well, you know, good for her. Um, I, I should put in a, a, a word about these board and care homes too. And it's too bad this one was grim, but when we think of assisted living as these big Marriott-like stucco facilities at the intersection of every interstate, and that's what a lot of them are. But there are also the forerunners of these, where these small kind of family-operated mom-and-pop assisted livings that, um, that, that are residences for six people or eight people, and they're licensed by the state. Um, and they can be actually a good option for people who don't want the cruise ship model, you know, the 150 residents and the big dining room. And some people want that. If you want a bridge game, you know, you, you're having trouble walking and you're in a wheelchair but you want your Scrabble game or your bridge game, you might need 50 people to find the people to play with. Um, but if you have dementia, let's say, and you would benefit from a smaller, cozier, more familial kind of housing, um, some of these board and care places work quite well. 
uh, and it's, it's an option that we kind of forget about because they don't have big ad budgets and they're not highly visible. Um, but, but almost every state does license them. And depending on um, who we're talking about and where we are, that can be an option too. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about a situation where one parent is a little bit more, is quite a bit more capable than the other and they're mm -hmm. taking care of each other. Um, and uh, let me explain my situation. Yeah. My mother is, uh, has had MS for almost 15 years now and her condition has been deteriorating. My father is still in good health and works full time as a professor. In the last uh, couple of months, uh, my mom's conditions uh, deteriorated rather rapidly and uh, dementia has been setting in for her. Uh, they're not, not yet 60. They're not yet 60, just shy of that. Um, so it's it, it's a little hard, but my concern is that um, as my mother my other, as my mother needs more help, and uh, as she as my father is going to start teaching again this fall, uh, what kind of uh, options are available for someone who who can no longer for them when a situation where my father knows almost everything about my mother's medical condition and it's been taking her to doctors for quite a while and it might not be able to handle that anymore and also it's very hard on him to right. be able to do that. Yeah, um, spouses are always the, the first line of defense, you know, and, and they believe that they should take care of each other. They, that was part of their vows. Um, but it can be... Um, it can be risky not only for the person who needs the most help, but also for the person who's giving it. This is physically demanding sometimes. If you're trying to help somebody who can't transfer, can't walk and can't transfer from, say, a wheelchair to a bed or a wheelchair to a toilet, and you're trying to lift that person, even if the person is fairly light, this is something that people get trained to do. And it's, it's um, especially if um, the other spouse is not very elderly, but somewhat elderly himself, you don't want him doing all this lifting. Um, and, uh, and yet, I think it's very difficult to try to persuade a couple to have another person come into the household and take over some of those caregiving duties. That's what spouses think they're supposed to do. Um, but as the deterioration, some of this will be settled for you because as the deterioration increases, he will not physically be able to do it. Um, do, do you have any um, kind of uh, social service agency or professional that's involved with them? Or are they really doing it all themselves? Oh, the condition's been uh, deteriorating for a while. Now um, she's beginning to get home health um, covered by her insurance coming in and, and doing some of those things. My concern is more about uh, how my father can deal with it mentally. I'm sorry, handle it that, uh, emotionally. Oh, sorry. Uh, my concern is more that... Um, I'm worried about how my father is going to hold up mentally. Right. The, the physical challenges are, are there, but they're not my concern at this point yet. My the emotional part of it. Yes. Right. Um, there are support groups for caregivers, and the literature shows that they are effective in helping people through this period and letting them know about resources and helping them feel not alone and giving them a place to vent. I don't know how your professor father feels about support groups. This might not be his thing. Not at all. There are also support groups by telephone, so you don't actually have to go someplace. And there are online support groups, uh, especially if she has MS, there are support groups specifically for people with MS who need, whose caregivers need help. This might be a situation where you can lead him to water, but you can't make him drink. It's, it's there. Maybe if he doesn't like the group idea, the idea of an individual therapist, but you know, there is a generational thing here where like, therapist talking about your problems, airing your dirty laundry in public is just anathema. Will he even talk to you about it if you just sat down with him at lunch one day and said this must be really hard? It, it's very hard for me to get him to talk to. Yeah. He will not talk to my sister about it. For me, it's a little bit... Uh, it's a little bit more available, but yeah. hardly the kind of person. Yeah, it's it's heartbreaking um, because he doesn't have to be as alone with it as he as it sounds like he is. Um, and maybe as the situation gets more demanding, he will realize that he needs more help. Um, 
the agency that the home care agency that's helping with the physical care may also have social workers that will work with him and so it's not bringing in another professional it's part of the same organization uh, geriatric care managers can do this too there's not a shortage of people who are willing to help him through this but how willing he is to do this is um, is the question and you know the, the the only thing you might be able to do is wait but I, I give you props for understanding that this is difficult and that he could use help and being ready to help him find it when he's ready. All right, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I have, a, I have a question about long-term care. Yes. 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 You're, you're loud, but we're being recorded. So I have a question about long-term care. Yeah. Um, and it's really being pushed by insurance companies now and by organizations like AARP. You mean about insurance? Long-term insurance, long-term care insurance. Okay. And uh, I know my father has bought some and, his, and my stepmother. Mm -hmm. But I had the unpleasant experience of um, going with somebody through the uh, process of trying to collect on uh, long-term disability insurance. So somebody I know uh, worked for a major tech company. All the tech companies provide long-term disability insurance to their employees. There's millions of people covered by this. But when you actually develop a long-term illness, and it can be many, many things that are completely incapacitating, the insurance companies fight like hell to avoid paying you. And the only way that you can actually win is to be incredibly persistent, to never give up, to get lawyers, to go to court. And I kind of, for myself, wonder about getting long-term care insurance because at, let's just say it's 2,000 a year times 10, that's 20,000, the price will go up. That's $20,000 in 10 years to get from 60 to 70. Right. From 70 to 80, that's another 20000 So that's like 40000 post-tax dollars that, right. that you earned, you know, a lot more to get there. And you and probably then I don't wonder need it whether, And then when, when you need it, you may not be in condition to read all the small print and, and to, to know how to fight. So, or, so I just kind of really wonder whether this is the biggest scam. I'm, I'm, I'm really torn because part of me feels like, well, maybe I should start getting it when I'm, you know, right. at the age where the rates are reasonable. But on the other hand, I just, I, I don't know if we have any data on whether they actually pay at the end. Um, right. And, you know, it's, it's different from disability insurance in what it does, but your fear is that, is that as with disability insurance, it will not pay out when you need it. Right. Um, yeah, and and there have been you know, the, the the New York Times uh, ran a story about this about a year ago about people uh, fighting to get paid for it because it's it's a fairly new product. Um, AARP is an advocate of it, but it also sells it. Uh, AARP sells a lot of products these days. Um, so yeah, you know I, I had that anxiety too. Uh, there are certain things you can do to protect yourself. Uh, one is to use really well-established and um, uh, historically willing to pay out insurance companies as opposed to new ones that are untested. Um, another is to make sure your policy is flexible. You know, sometimes they're made so restrictive that you have to be completely incapacitated to collect. They, they will specify how many ADLs do you need help with. Um, and you want to be able to collect if you only need help with a couple of ADLs. If, if, if you can still feed yourself and dress yourself, you might still need care insurance because you can't walk, let's say. So you're looking for a policy with fewer ADLs. You're looking for a policy that provides care at home or in a facility that doesn't mandate that you have to move. You're looking for a policy that says you can hire anybody that can help you so you could hire a family member, let's say. It doesn't have to be somebody who's an RN or a certified nursing assistant. You're looking for a flexible policy that provides a pot of money that you can use in the way that best helps you. Um, but 
you're right to say it's a little unnerving. As with any insurance policy, you're paying in a lot years before you need it rather than waiting until you almost need it when the cost is prohibitive. It is a bit of a gamble. And, uh, you know, I, I looked at various companies and um, looked at their ratings online and read the National Association of Insurance Commissioners guidelines and you know, bought a policy through the Credit Union Insurance uh, Association that I think will take care of me and I hope it's true. But you're, you're right, there are scams and there are policies that are not purely scams but that are constructed so narrowly that they're not gonna be of much help. And it is kind of a thicket and a new, a, a new reality that we're dealing with because of this extended lifespan. I, I think you're right to be suspicious and yet in the end I decided to do it myself and I would encourage other people to do it carefully because otherwise you really have no help uh, if you want to stay in your home and you're not impoverished. You know, there, there is currently no government program that does that uh, unless you are Medicaid eligible. So that was a risk I wasn't willing to take, but I understand people who think it's too much of a gamble. It's, it, things will get better. They will be more regulated. There may be a public option if the Kennedy, this Kennedy legislation passes, that would be uh, probably preferable. But to me, it, um, I thought it was worth the risk. I understand why you might think not. Hey. So you've mentioned different options and different um, ways of aging in place and also not in place. Right. Uh, you talked about um, board and care, staying in home, assisted living. Of course, there are the continuum, continuum of care facilities where uh, people over certain ages can have independent living and then if they need to go to assisted living and then into full, into skilled nursing. And I'm wondering if there are other models that you've come across. For example, you were just talking about all those continuum of care places tend to be private. Like is there any, is there any movement to make, to make that po available um, through a public option for that, or mm. intergenerational co-housing, where not you're not necessarily segregating people by age, but you at the, at the present time there are licensing problems, and you can't do that at least in California. Mm. But you know, are there are there other models that that maybe aren't as commonly used that maybe are getting some more attention? The thing I'm hearing about is something called intentional communities, which is a broad term and it doesn't refer only to older people. But ideas that these aging in place is the sort of gold standard. It's what everybody wants. You know, bring services to people where they are. Don't make them move and disrupt their lives to go where the services are. It turns out to be difficult to do, difficult to finance. It's not efficient economically to have 20 people in their houses needing nursing as opposed to having 20 people in one place with a nurse, and yet it's what we all would prefer. So intentional communities, the first one was Beacon Hill Village in Boston. Uh, there's one in Palo Alto, several in Washington now, a um, couple in uh, Cambridge. They, they tend to be where there are groups of well-educated, fairly affluent, fairly civic-minded older people who are trying to stave off having to move. And these are nonprofit organizations um, which people pay, a, an annual, pay an annual fee. Um, to organize a neighborhood or sometimes a building, the Watergate complex in Washington, organize to provide services for people where they are. So there might, we might contract with um, a van service or a taxi company to work with your community. You, you call the central office and say, I, need a, I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow, send the car. They do that. Uh, or um, they contract with home care agencies or places that will retrofit your housing so that you can, you can use um, a volume discount in effect to try to buy services that people will need and to keep them at home. Uh, and I don't know if this is going to spread uh, or if it's going to be like food co-ops. You know, it's, it's a nice thing to have, but it's not where most people buy their groceries. Not clear, but, but people are trying to figure this out. People have been saying for years, the boomers are not going to put up with this. The boomers are going to find another way to do this. Um, Maybe. I'm not seeing it yet, but it's, you know, it would be a great thing to think about. Uh, Co-housing is such a small proportion. It, it doesn't really register yet. It's so individual. 
it makes sense to me, especially because some people don't have families. They don't have children to take care of them or nieces and nephews. They need to, they're going to need to bond together with their peers. They're, it would be great to have a way to do that that's, that's not so individual that every single co-housing group has to figure it out for themselves. There are co-housing associations. Um, this is uncharted territory. I don't think we know. Um, so I've been through this with, let's see, my father-in-law, my father, two aunts, and an uncle. And have you seen, should have written this book. <laughs> well, maybe, I am feeling like I'm getting close to the number of people. And one of the things that it's really led to in terms of conversations but not conclusions is that my husband and I are looking at, you know, all of these people should have planned ahead a lot earlier, and maybe we shouldn't make that mistake. Um, as I said, it leads to a lot of interesting conversations, but we haven't come to any conclusions. Yeah. I'm assuming you've had similar thoughts. What kinds of conclusions have you come to? You know, I, I'm not there either. I had this policy. I can't retire. I'm going to have to work till I drop. And uh, I have one daughter I don't want to burden with this um, unduly. So I, I haven't figured it out either. Um, but w when you figure it out, <laughs> let, let, let the rest of us know. You know th these are very individual decisions. We're all kind of groping in the dark. There's not a generation before us that ever had quite this combination of demographic and legislative and financial situations. Um, so I, I, I don't fault us for not knowing yet. We're, we're different. We're going to have to do different things than our parents and grandparents did. We don't quite know what. Question on advanced directives and DNRs specifically. The uh, had a coworker whose father had a DNR and he had had multiple problems. He was in the hospital. When he finally died, my coworker felt that they could have done more, but they pretty much said, DNR, we're done. Um, and I'm he curious. had a DNR because the patient himself wanted it. Yes, absolutely. Right. And so I, that really kind of caught me unawares because my, you know, I and my parents have worked out uh, power of attorney and all that. But it, have you encountered any stories of these kinds of double-edged swords of um, the caregivers basically saying, well, this implies that we're not going to not only take heroic measures, but really not take many measures at all? Um, we're almost out of time. I'm getting signals. But uh, the, the new thing I've heard now is that people don't like the term DNR, so we should call it an AND or ADN, allowed to die naturally. Because, um, the, the bigger problem really is people trying to, do, is physicians and hospitals trying to do too much rather than not do enough. And I think people have the right to make these decisions. Um, but 25% or so of the Medicare budget is spent on the last years of people's lives. And this is going to be a scarcity issue. How much do we spend on adults? And how much do we spend on elderly adults? And how much do we spend on other people? Um, I, yeah, I'm out of time. Thank you so much for listening. Um, the book is When the Time Comes. The website is paulaspan.com. And I think this conversation is going to continue for all of us. Thanks.